Good morning, church. It has been a while. Man, why'd you get it? Come on, Mike. Got that song stuck in my head now. It's been a while since I could say. Okay, amen. Let's go to God in prayer. I got to get my heart in the right place and get my focus back. I'm easily distracted today. Let's go to God in prayer. God, thank you for this morning. It's great to be together. God, what a great time of year, Father. It's uh, so amazing to be able to celebrate uh, the Christmas holiday. And uh, God, it's, uh, this is the time of year when more people think about you and your son than probably any other. And God, I do pray that uh, as uh, people that are seeking you and want to be close to you, God, that we wouldn't get caught up in, in some of the things that others might get caught up in, but instead that it would draw us closer to you, Father, that uh, this time of focusing on your son and focusing on uh, the events around the nativity scene, Father, that we would be uh, just uh, continually stand in awe of what you've done. And the fact that you sent your son Jesus uh, to be on this earth, uh, for you to take the form of flesh, uh, for the creator to become uh, the created is just an amazing thing, God, that we'll probably never fully grasp. But God, I pray that we can uh, as much as possible, just uh, get our hearts and, and minds inspired, God, by what's happened. And uh, we just pray for this morning as we dig into your word, that, God, you would uh, encourage us, inspire us, move our hearts. God, help us to, uh, you know, maybe break out of some of the spiritual doldrums that can uh, kind of uh, take hold of us. And uh, pray that uh, we can just uh, really, God, uh, focus on your word today and what it has to say. We love you. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. That's where we'll get started here in a little bit. But uh, do appreciate the uh, time we had last night. It was really encouraging. For those of you that weren't able to come, I apologize because we had a blast last night. Uh, we got to dance. You know, I did some dancing last night. And uh, you might be wondering why I'm wearing tennis shoes today. And that's why. Uh, the back is a little hurt. And I think I fractured my spleen or... <laughs> Something like that. If you can fracture your spleen, I think I did. Um, yeah, I'm a little sore today. Um, I was doing stuff like uh, my daughter probably never thought I would do this, but because she never thought I would, I'm going to. So I'm going to just throw down one of these this morning. Okay, just wanted to do it from the stage. That's called a dab. If you didn't know what that is, then God bless you. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the, story, the title of my lesson this morning is A Tale of Two Parents and an Extraordinary Son. So it might sound a little familiar to you. I just ripped off the title of my own sermons that I did not too long ago. Because uh, I really did want to focus these next three weeks on what I call the big three of the nativity story. And that would be Joseph, Mary, and the baby Jesus. Uh, you know, there's a lot of cool sermons you've probably heard over the years kind of regarding those characters. But especially... You know, I, I think about Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, and there was a pretty amazing little family unit there. Uh, to, to think that, you know, think about what it would be like to be Joseph or Mary in the pressure that would be involved in raising the Son of God. You think you have a hard time raising your kid right now, parents. Could you imagine raising the Son of God as your child? There's some intense pressure, right? But uh, we're going to talk today about Joseph. He's going to be our focus today. He's kind of a little bit of an unknown figure when it comes to the Bible. There's, there's a lot of parts left out about Joseph. We kind of get his early stuff, but then after a while, he just kind of disappears from the story, and we don't know what happened. You know, a lot of historians think that perhaps he died at some, you know, that he died at, in Jesus' childhood. You know, after we know around the age of 12, he was there. But then into his teenage years, we don't know anything about him. When we get into his ministry, he just deals with his mom and his brothers. We never really know what happened with Joseph. But the cool thing is with Joseph is the early stuff that we have really gives us some insight into what kind of character he was and why, I think in many ways, why he was chosen. Because he really did have an amazing character. He was a very strong believer he was someone who followed the law and was really a righteous man. And so let's, uh, let's talk about Joseph today, shall we? Uh, let's get into some of the stuff about him and Matthew. But uh, before we do that, I want to give us a little bit of background. Because I think it's important to understand 
kind of the way things were back in the day. So this picture up here is a typical Jewish house in the third century. Now, granted, that's 300 years previous to Jesus' time, but I think this gives us a little bit of an idea. As I went and kind of looked through pictures on the Internet, I was trying to find something. This really looks similar to what they had back then. This is how they lived. And so what you had was kind of what would be called a compound. And so it wasn't just that, you know, like today we have little family units that live by themselves. Well, back in, you know, first century time, everybody lived together. You know, there was big family units that lived together. It was grandma, grandpa, great grandma, great grandpa, aunts, uncles. They all lived in one area together. And so there was a very different scenario than what we have today. Today we kind of, you know, you get married, you move off on your own, sometimes move to a different state, different city, whatever. Back then it was a very different story. And so um, what would happen was in the first century when mom and dad gave birth to a boy, they would begin to search for a potential mate. So it was like right off the bat they were thinking, okay, I've got a boy here. He's going to need a wife. So we got we to gotta find somebody for him. And when they found a solid family who they thought would raise a great daughter for their son, they would attempt to reach an agreement with the family of the bride. Jewish uh, families live primarily in family compounds. And uh, if you've seen images of archaeological digs, you have likely seen the home built with some kind of rectangular brick, each room adjacent to one another, kind of like what we see here. In fact, that's why G the Jews understood Jesus' references as him being a cornerstone. If you remember that reference of Jesus saying, I am the cornerstone. You know, that's how they understood it. They understood, okay, for us to build a compound like this, we got to start with the cornerstone. Oh, that makes sense, right? If I'm going to build a great building, I've got to have a solid cornerstone. That's where everything else is going to get built off of. Jesus, i got to build with him, you know? Really cool connection. When you dig through the history, you can see when Jesus spoke and some of the stuff that we're like, what's that mean? You know, when he talks about a mustard seed and all that stuff, it's not common to us. But to those who farm for a living, it was very common. So when the bridegroom reached marrying age, the patriarchs would trek to the bride's village, the one that they made the agreement with, and, the, and to that compound for them to meet. And so a lot of times, depending on how far apart they live, this could be the first time that they met. Could you imagine that in this day and age? It's like your family treks you over and says, this is the person we made the agreement with. This is who you're going to marry, <laughs> you know? And, and the thing was, though, it wasn't like they were forced to marry him. There was a lot of strong, you know, uh, influence. But they weren't forced to. They could make a decision. And so they would... If they agreed to the decision, if the bride and groom would, then the father would negotiate a bride price with the bride's dad. So there would be an actual price he'd pay. Okay, okay, here's the money I'm going to give you. Here's the, you know, the, the livestock or whatever it is that I'm going to give you in order to take this bride home for my son. Then what they would do at that point is they would leave the bride there. They would go home. They would build an addition to the compound for the bride and the, the um, groom to live in. And so if you could imagine this kind of situation here, this scenario, the bride would be waiting. She's like, okay, I've agreed to marry this guy. Now I'm just going to be sitting here and waiting. There wasn't like there was emails, text messages, phone calls. It's like, I'm just going to wait for them to come back. Who knows how long that'll be. They're going to build this thing out of brick. It's not like they got cranes and all that stuff. This is going to take a while. But they would just wait in anticipation for them to come back and pick them up. So it's kind of with this sort of stuff going on. If you can picture how this might have been like, this is the background of what we're going to see as we look at Joseph and Mary and kind of all the dynamics that were going on around that time. So look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. And this kind of starts off the story of Jesus' birth. And it says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. And before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now, regardless of whether the bridegroom returned for the bride with only the patriarchs 
or his whole family in order to have a wedding ceremony, I want you to imagine the bridegroom showing up after going home. You know, they've agreed, they've paid the bride price, they went home, they've set up the, the whole section. You know, it would have been part of the groom's responsibility to help build this addition to the house. They're getting prepared. The whole family's excited. We're going to have this addition to our family, this bride for our son who we've all helped raise up together, right? And then what happens? He goes to pick up his bride, and what's he find out? She's pregnant. Could you imagine the controversy that would have went on at that point? The bride, is she a liar? You know, is she un- was she unfaithful? Is she fickle? Does she really want to be with me? Could you imagine what Joseph would have been feeling? The groom himself, he would have felt probably humiliated and angry. The whole future would be in doubt. Look, we just did all of this work. And I was really excited about taking this Mary as my bride. And now this? Really? Think about the bride's family, how they would have felt. A sense of embarrassment, maybe. Scared of their daughter's fate. If she had been unfaithful, what did the law say could happen to her? She could get stoned to death, right? They were fearful. Man, what's going to happen to her? Do we have to give the bride price back? (laughs) All the stuff we've just accrued, do we need to give it back now? Think about the girl's family, how they would have felt. Are you kidding me? After everything we've done... We made this agreement a long time ago. You can't control your daughter here. I mean, there would be so much disgrace on both families because of this situation. And it makes you wonder, like, well, how did Joseph respond to that? Well, here's the amazing thing. Look at verse 19. Because Joseph, and this is where we get a lot of insight into Joseph's character here, but because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now you read this and it kind of, it's just one verse and you kind of read it and go, okay, you know, but there's really a lot revealed here about Joseph and about the kind of character that he had. Number one, it says he was faithful to the law. Some translations saying that says that he's being being a righteous man. Joseph didn't take the easy way out. He was one who did the right thing regardless of the consequences. He cared more about fulfilling the requirements of the law than he did about doing what was easy or comfortable. You see this in numerous times throughout. As we go through the story, you'll see where Joseph makes these decisions that are, you know what, I've got to fulfill the law. Because back then, before Jesus' ministry, before he came, before he died on the cross, the way you were faithful to God was you were faithful to the law. You did what the law said. You You fulfilled the requirements of the law. And that showed your obedience and love for God. And there was, it wasn't like, go back and read Leviticus, Deuteronomy, go lead, read some of those letters sometime, some of those, you know, uh, books in the Bible. There's a lot there that had to be done. We got easy nowadays, you know. They had to do a lot of things when it came to sin and things they had to, needed to sacrifice and all that. It was difficult, but Joseph was a man who said, you know what, I'm going to be faithful to the law no matter what. The second thing that's pretty amazing here, not only was he faithful to the law, but he didn't want to expose Mary to public disgrace. Think about this for a second. He has every right, at least in his mind, early on to do so. The way it looks initially is that Mary's been unfaithful. And according to the law that he's faithful to, he has every right to subject her to public humiliation because he would have been getting a lot of grief and for him to even make the decision to not expose her to that he probably would have got a lot of grief from his family but this shows the character of joseph he says this is going to be my wife and i'm going to protect her 
and I'm going to protect her family name even at the expense of my own. What a great character. To do that, to even think to do that, shows a, a real tight relationship with God, doesn't it? And then this last part here. He had in mind to divorce Mary quietly. He knew a public divorce would bring her shame. It w more than likely would have restored his dignity, but would have trashed hers. He cares more about Mary's reputation than he does his own. What a great character guy. Man, you're like, look at this and go, no wonder God chose him, right? What a great character guy that he didn't even let the let, even though he was faithful to the law, he didn't let the letter of the law be what drove him. It was the heart of the law. And the heart of the law is I need to love this woman that God chose for me and I'm a protector no matter what. But even in all this, Joseph is in a precarious situation, isn't he? But look what he does. Look at his, go down to verse 20 here. This is a pretty amazing story here. If you really kind of consider it. Verse 20, but after he had considered this, meaning the divorcing her quietly, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to, uh, to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. So think about what was going on. This is a, <clears throat> I didn't know these existed, but apparently in the, in the Catholic religion especially, this is a pretty, a fairly important statue. But this is this uh, statue of Joseph um, sleeping. And he's having, this is when he dreamed this dream. And you can think about, think about the heightened emotional state that Joseph was probably in. Trying to figure out all this that's going on. So he goes to sleep, right? He has this dream. And in the dream, he learns three, he learns three very important facts here. Number one, the baby doesn't have a father. Other than God, which is a fact, right? The other thing is that he needs to take Mary as his wife. And the third thing is he needs to name him Jesus. He needs to name him Jesus, which means Savior. Now, an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream. When you wake up, you need to do what I commanded you. Now, think about this for a second. Okay, we've been through this whole situation here. Joseph is... Like, okay, I'm tired. I need to get some sleep. This is a lot to process, okay? We've done all this work. We went and took, get my bride, all this stuff, right? And then he goes to sleep and has a dream. And in the dream, there's an angel coming to him and saying, here's the things you need to do. Could you imagine sharing that dream with somebody afterwards? Like, dude, you are crazy, okay? Listen to what's going on here. Your bride was unfaithful. Now you're saying you had a dream about an angel, Dude, get a grip, right? But instead, he listens to the dream. He's that in touch with God that he can discern the Spirit talking to him. What an amazing heart, right? How many of us would listen to a dream being in an extreme circumstance like that? Most of us would probably be like, that was weird. Listen to what happened but not go, yeah, this is what I need to do. Number one, there's no dad. Number two, I need to just take her as my wife. Number three, I need to protect her, right? Crazy, and I need to name him Jesus? That's not even a family name, you know? Normally we'd name him after grandpa, but you want me to name him Jesus? Okay, I guess we'll do that, you know? What about us in this kind of situation? What is our sensitivity to the Spirit's calling? 
I thought about this when I read this. I'm like, man, would I have been like Joseph? I get, I've been in these situations, as many of you have, where emotions run high. Things are going on in your life. There's challenges going on. And the Spirit communicates things to us. But can we hear it when it comes? Are we able to hear it even through the emotions? If you paused right now and thought about your family, your coworkers, your finances, your time, what's the Spirit calling you to do even today? Are you listening to what the Spirit has to say? Joseph listened. And look what happened after that. It's an amazing story, isn't it? Even with all that, even with him listening to the Spirit, doing what's right, it doesn't get any easier. Look at Luke chapter 2. I want you to turn over that part because that kind of gives us a little more of the story here. Luke chapter 2 verse 4 says, So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for him. It is very possible that Joseph and Mary were disowned by their families at this time. It's very possible. We don't know that for sure, but it's very possible that at this time, once he got up from his dream and decided he was going to do what he's going to do and did it, it's very possible that his family said, forget this, that they would have been cast out on their own to do what they had to do. So what does Joseph decide to do? He says, let's go and register for the census. Okay. So Mary is very pregnant, and we're going to travel 90 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem to register for the census. How many of you women who've had babies would say, that sounds like a great idea to be in your third trimester and say, Let, put me on the back of a camel or a donkey, and let's go 90 miles to register. Couldn't we just do a write-in? <laughs> Couldn't we just mail an absentee ballot? I was there. You know I was there. You know who I am. Just count me. But again, Joseph wanted to do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And that was to do what he was told to do. To fulfill what the law said to do. What an amazing heart. And you have to think about this for a second as well. What kind, of, what kind of materials would they have had to have to make this journey? They would have had to rely on God a lot, right? To be able to get the food and the water that they needed. To be able to make that trip. Obviously, the bumping kind of jostled the baby. Because as, as, as soon as they get there, the baby's coming, right? And then Mary goes into labor. And many historians think that it was likely wintertime, that it was likely very cold. And when we see the nativity scenes and stuff, we see these little barns, right? More than likely, it was not a barn. More than likely, it was more like a cave that they were in. And if you see this picture, this is from, uh, I believe it's the movie called The Nativity. But this is much what it probably would have been like, absent the light, like shining from the hole, right on the white baby. I doubt the baby was white, okay? More Middle Eastern, okay? Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, sorry for all us white people out there to be crushed that Jesus wasn't a white guy, you know? So be it. But, uh, but can you imagine this? Okay, just get back in Joseph's head again, Okay. You've done all these things to continually fulfill the law. You keep doing what's right over and over again. Okay, I listened to the dream. I've done this. I've done that. But things don't get better for you. They get a little bit worse. Now, instead of being somewhere warm, we're in a cave. And there's no inn available. No room in the inn. There's no comfortable place to have this baby, so we're going to go into a cave where there's a bunch of livestock. You can imagine how that smelled. 
right? Go in, I'm going to use this manger, which was a feeding trough. And this is where Mary's going to have our son. This immaculately conceived baby is going to be born in this trough. But yet, you don't hear anything from Joseph about him being bitter. He just goes with the flow. Can you imagine the character that this guy had to have? Wouldn't you be tempted, brothers, to feel pretty mad about this situation? Are you kidding me? I've done all the things I'm supposed to do, and there can't be a room that's open. And the fact that all these people are just selfish, man. My wife's having a baby. You can't give up your room. You know? Like, look. But he had to go through all that, right? He would have been, I bet you he was tempted to feel like he was a bad provider. You know, guys, that's a big thing for us, isn't it? We want to provide for our families, provide for our wives, provide for our kids. He probably would have been tempted to feel like he was a bad provider. And even then, maybe too, he was feeling a little tempted to not believe all this stuff that's going on. I have to, I would have to think that. That at some point he'd go, this is absurd. <laughs> you know, okay, this is just, I've went along with this long enough. This is just absurd. But not once do you get any feeling that he doubted any of it. He just continued to march along and do what was right. Joseph's righteousness never seems to depend on blessings. And I wonder if the same could be said about ours. Are we just righteous and do the right thing because we know God's going to bless us for it? Or do we do it because God called us to do it? And that's how you can tell if your love has went to a different level or not. If you're just expecting, well, you know what? I'm going to go to church and read my Bible and submit myself to discipling and share my faith with people because I know God will bless it. Or this is what God's commanded. I'm going to do it because I love him. Where do you fall? To be honest with you, I'll be really honest. A lot of times I fall on that first one. As I know God will bless it. And my love for God isn't always as strong as I want it to be. And that's what I fight for. As I fight to have that heart that says, I want to be like Joseph. You know, that no matter what, I'm just going to do what's right because it's the right thing to do. And it's because what God wants me to do. And I think it's because of that heart that he gets chosen to be Jesus' dad. Look at these next verses here, Luke chapter 2, 41 through 52. It says, when every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. They began looking for him among their relatives and friends. Probably got DFS called on him today, wouldn't he? You walk for a whole day without knowing where your kid is? When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, that's a long time. I'd been freaking out. After three days, they found him in the temple courts. Well, of course he was in the temple courts, right? Sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? You could see a Middle Eastern mom saying that, right? Probably some Midwestern mom saying that as well. <laughs> Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why are you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Jerusalem with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. I think there's a couple of uh, uh, things that I really want to point out here. Or three things I want to point out here about this little passage that kind of show us the character of Joseph. 
One of those, it says, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. This was a very, very important festival for Jewish people, the Passover. Remembering the Passover time when Moses and the people were about to be set free from Pharaoh, right? And this was a time that they remembered and they celebrated yearly. And Joseph made sure that his family was there for the celebration every year. Because he wanted Jesus to understand what it was that was their religion. This is why we do what we do. This is why we believe what we believe. Here, son, we're going to go to this festival because I want you to learn about our past, about our family, about where we come from. You know, dad, I want to talk to you specifically right now. What's your commitment with your children when it comes to all things God? Are you consistent in bringing them to church and making sure that they're tied in with other disciples, kids, that they're building the relationships that they need to build? Are you consistent with sharing God with them? Not just through devotionals, but also just with your daily walk. Many of us grew up in families where God wasn't number one. And look what it did to us. Yep. Now, dads, I know what you want to say, and moms may be this too. Well, look at me. I turned out okay by the grace of God. Amen. By the grace of God, you turned out okay. Amen. Don't you dare put that yoke on your kids. Don't you say, well, I grew up pagan, so they'll be fine. Will they? Will they? I've got a whole school full of kids that will tell you different. All you got to do is hear some of the stories that your kid tells you when they come home from public school. Make your toenails curl. Dads, moms, we got to step up. We got to imitate Joseph and Mary. Who every year, they were consistent. And it wasn't just that. You know what Jesus saw in his dad? A man who was committed to doing what was right. Dads, are we going to be that person for our kids? The other thing here is when Jesus said to them, he said, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? I imagine that that probably, you know, it says Mary treasured up these things in her heart. We'll talk about that more next week. But a little bit of an aside to that, I have to think Mary had a little bit of a smile on her face. Because we know that from what we see with Joseph, he was very committed to his relationship with God. He listened to a dream. <laughs> he did the things that were commanded of him to do. And I have to think that even though it probably caused them a great amount of stress to be looking for their kid for several days, that it had to have a smile on their face when they found out where he was. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wouldn't that make you happy, yeah. brothers and sisters, if your kid, Amen. you couldn't find him for a while, where were they? They were in trying to understand the book of the law better. <laughs> I imagine my kids wouldn't be there. I'd hope they would be. <laughs> I'd probably have to go find them at a basketball game or something, you know. But isn't that encouraging? What a great heart. I want you to think about this for a minute. Where did Jesus learn? Where did Jesus learn to be instructed by the scriptures? Where did Jesus learn to listen to the whisper of the spirit? Where did he learn the affirmation of these traits? I don't think it's a stretch to see the impact Joseph had on his son. You got to realize something here. Jesus was both man and deity. It wasn't that he was just Jesus walking around in bodily form and he was levitating as a child, going through life like this and doing healing his friend, you know, getting hit with a rock in the head, and he's like, and healing him and all that stuff. That wasn't what was going on. Jesus grew up much like we have. It says he was tempted in every way, just as we are. And for him to have the kind of compassion he had in his ministry, 
He had to have gone through some of the things we've gone through, most of the things, if not all the things we've gone through. But where did he learn how to respond correctly to those things? Was it just innate? I don't think it was. I think he learned it from his dad. I want you to think about these different things. Now, you can just write these scriptures down because we're going to go through them here pretty quick. But Matthew 4, 1 through 11 is Jesus is tempted in the desert. Where did Jesus learn to listen to the Spirit? I think it was from Joseph. Think about Matthew 5, the Beatitudes. Where did Jesus learn these godly virtues? And where did he le learn the results of them? Matthew 6, 25 through 33, when Jesus says, seek first the kingdom. Where did Jesus learn that God would provide his daily necessities? Where did Jesus learn that each day will worry about itself? Where did Jesus learn how God the Father clothed the lilies of the field? I think it was from watching his dad, Joseph. Matthew 14, when Jesus fed the 5,000. And he said they were hungry, hungry and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Where did Jesus learn to take care of the physical needs of others? Mark chapter 12, 13 through 17. Give to Caesars what is Caesars and to God what is God's. Where did Jesus learn to honor the law without compromising his convictions? Luke chapter 17, the 10 lepers. Where did Jesus learn this kind of compassion? Remember, Joseph had in mind to divorce Mary quietly. Where does Joseph learn to do the right thing, even when it's disgusting to all those around him? What about the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8? Where did Jesus learn not to judge someone's alleged impurity on face value? Where did he learn these things? I really do believe that it had to do with Joseph being his dad in the great example he set. Now, you might be looking at this and say, hey, I don't have kids. How's this apply to me, this side of the room? Hopefully, God willing, you'll have kids someday. And hopefully, you've worked on becoming more righteous so that when you do, you can set your kids a great example. This, slide, this side points for you, parents. <laughs> How well are you representing God to your children? How are you handling life in front of them? And I want you to specifically think about this verse. Deuteronomy 6, 4-9. You can just write this down. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your heads and bind them on your foreheads. Write, down, write them down on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. I think brothers, sisters, all of us, but especially parents, I want you to think about this. We need to set a goal to fall in love with righteousness. We need to shake loose of the worldly dreams that consume us and embrace the lessons God is teaching you in everything. And all the things he allows to happen to you, what are the lessons to learn? The only way to know whether we have fulfilled God's plan for our life or not is to strive for purity in heart and to realize that God's plan for us is way bigger than we'll ever know. Guys, this is what our kids need from us more than anything. This is the example, campus students, singles, that we need to set for the children that are coming up behind us. The ones that are going to lead us when we're old. You know, the ones that are going to be leading us are these kids. One of these days, Carter's going to be up here preaching to you. And you're going to be sitting back there going, wow, I remember when that boy didn't talk very much. Now he talks a lot. And he has a lot of great things to say. And he reminds me a lot of his dad and mom. Whoa, you know, I need to listen to what he has. This boy's convicting, you know, can you imagine that? That's what's going to happen. And we need to set them an example now of what it looks like to be disciples. When little Emrys, I know he's just a little baby right now. 
Imrus Bozell, man, that kid's going to grow up one day and he's going to be sharing some scriptures with you. He ain't going to be sitting back there, you know, 80 years old, sitting in a chair, listening to him. You're going to be like, amen, you know. But how's he going to get there? How are our kids going to get to that spot? We've got to set them a great example. And it's going to be falling in love with righteousness. Too many of us are in love with what the world has to offer. We're too in love with, I got to set them a great example of how to take care of their money. Well, yeah, you do. You do. That's part of being spiritual, but that's not everything. Some of us say stuff like, I've heard this. I want to raise my kids to be individuals. Okay. Raise them to be an individual disciple who's part of a whole. You know, we get so many of these things stuck in our heads that are just not the dreams of God. And we wonder why our kids don't fall in love with Jesus. What are we going to do? What's the example that we're going to set? We're not going to be perfect. We're going to fall down, but that's also teaching. It's falling down and getting back up and them seeing that. You know what my hope my kids will say someday? I hope they'll say, you know what? I saw my dad persevere. He fell down, but he always got back up. I hope they'll see that from me. I don't want them to say, oh, my dad was perfect. No, I want them to see what real life looks like, but that I stayed faithful to God anyway. Wouldn't that be great if your kids saw that in you? Wouldn't that be great if the kids who are coming up under you looked at you and said, man, I love, I love Joey. He's awesome. He's such a great example. He's falling down, but he always gets back up. You know, look at Thomas, man. Thomas always has those creepy pictures where he's looking kind of weird in the background. But you know what? He's faithful. He's a faithful guy. We like Thomas. We're going to follow him. Man, I tell you, our kids are looking right at you. And not just your kids looking at you, but they're looking at the rest of the adults in the congregation as well. And your faith makes a lot of difference. Your commitment to righteousness makes a lot of difference. You don't want them looking around going, you know what? I don't want to be a part of this because all I see is a bunch of weak people. That's my biggest fear. My kids will say, you know what? I don't want to be a part of this. I'd rather go be a part of the glitz and glamour of the life church. Because it's a lot more fun there. And people seem more committed there than they do here. What do you want? We got to decide, don't we? What will be, what example will we set for this world? Parents, on what shoulders will your children stand on? What picture of God are you painting for the world and our children? God has given you everything you need to be like Joseph and honestly to imitate Jesus. The interesting thing here is Joseph set a great example for Jesus so he could be Jesus. But where did he get that example? From Jesus. Mind blown, right? But it's amazing. And guys, I want to call us today to this example. A man of tremendous righteousness in Joseph. Let's, we're going to take the communion together. And I want to share this little thought with you as we go into the communion. You know, Bethlehem sat in the shadow of Herod's palace. The palace was about as magnificent as you could have ever imagined for that day and age and sat atop a hill which could be seen from Bethlehem as well as the valley where David used to keep his sheep. Now we all know that God had chosen to make Esau submissive to Jacob despite the fact that Esau uh, actually appear significantly more righteous in the Bible than Jacob does. Nonetheless, in God's greater plan, Esau's descendants were to become Gentiles and Jacob's descendants were to become Israel and ultimately produce the Messiah. Despite the biblical prophecy, the Messiah was born to this young couple in the shadow of the symbol of Herod's ultimate power. And if you didn't already know this, Herod was an Elamite, a descendant of Esau. Jesus, Joseph, and Mary spent the first part of Jesus' life running from Herod's authority. 
and Jesus ultimately was murdered at the hands of Herod's authority, Rome. What looked like an absolute failure to everyone who had been told that Jesus was the Messiah was actually God's perfect plan. As we remember to Jesus today, I want you to examine our hearts and imitate him and the good things about his earthly dad as well as about his heavenly one. And I, want, and I pray that you'll be inspired and realize that, yeah, God's chosen little old broken us to be his tools to reach the world. And it does seem foolish, doesn't it? When you look at the whole story, it seems ridiculous. Even the story of Jesus, even the story of his birth, all that, it seems ridiculous. But in the end, it's a powerful, powerful story because you can see God written all over it. And that's the life you get to have when you follow him as well. Amen? Amen. Let's go to God in prayer as we consider the cross and all that Jesus has done for us. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning.